Hi guys and welcome to our first official lecture. The lecture is going to go for the span of the next three days. Why so much time? Well, quite simply because we are looking at history, the history of cinema. Cinema comes from the, from the French cinematographe, which means motion picture. So when you hear cinematography, it is literally the study of a motion picture get us started we are going to go on about lantern slides these are really neat and I've got a little two minute video that I want you to watch um, and pay attention to and it will explain what lantern slides are well or to start slides Slides under there, slides there, slides over there, slides in here. <laughs> oh, I found them all over the country as I traveled around and different antique collector shows and whatever. And this one probably wouldn't impress anybody nowadays. However, you go back a hundred and some odd years ago. And when you saw something like that on the screen, moving in color, Everybody was, oh, ah. Usually you would start a show with one of these. And uh, so it just, what they did back then was unbelievable. It's not always just messy, sometimes it's worse. I've got so many projects going, but I don't have time to get bored. Uh, I did all my coming attraction slides, and then I started doing my advertising slides, and then I got sidetracked on doing my slides from uh, mm -hmm. Joseph Boggs Beale, who was a artist back in Philadelphia. And he did the original artwork for oh, about at least 1800 Magic Lantern slides. And I have the second largest collection of his slides in the country. And his artwork was on basically a 16 by 16 paper and watercolor. Then they were photographed down to the image to go and then contact prints were made. And when they made these things, they didn't have all these special paints to stick onto glass and how this, some of this stuff is stuck like that kaleidoscope for over a hundred years. Uh, and a lot of these things were stored in garages, basements, uh, barns, whatever, you know, to wash all kinds of conditions. And it's just amazing how they have managed to survive. Okay, so that was part of the earliest type of cinematography or cinema. And then the 19th century hit and the 19th century saw a massive production of visual forms of popular culture. Yes, pop, pop culture existed way back in the 19th century. In the industrial era, we saw more um, books of ph photography, uh, illustrated fiction, and the middle and the working class people tended to visit circuses, go to amusement parks, music halls, theater troops, dioramas. Uh, they liked to go to places where they could see the dioramas and stereoscopes. And we will talk about what the dioramas and stereoscopes are. Here's a diorama. It's basically a painted backdrop and features a 3D figure, uh, usually depicting some sort of historical events. You can still come across dioramas. You usually find those at um, uh, like rest stops between states. Then stereoscopes came out. Stereoscopes are really cool. They are these little handheld viewers that create three-dimensional effects by using oblong cards with two photographs printed side by side. So your eyes would be forced to focus individually, so it would give you the illusion of three dimensions. All right, I'm gonna slow down a little bit because you should be taking notes on the preconditions for motion pictures. All right, and again, you can visit the um, PowerPoint slide that I'm going over right now that is in your Schoology uh, for today. So, number one, first of all, scientists had to realize that the human eye will perceive motions if a series of slightly different images is placed before it in rapid succession. So if um, you have 
a series of pictures, 16 pictures, and you put them boom, in one second, it would look like a little bit of motion, okay? So it takes about 16 images per second for our eyes to be tricked to make us think that we are seeing movement. Um, and here is another short video. Okay, here we go. Got this set up in my screen. bathroom since the lights are nice and bright and it's got a big mirror. Hopefully the focus on the camera will work well. And let's give it a try and see what happens. You can see the Make logo spinning in 3D. Now if you're not looking through the slots, See if I can angle this a little bit. You know, you can see it really doesn't do anything. The key is to look through the slots. Well, hopefully some of you guys will try and make your own. It's a really fun project. I've included a blank dial to download on the website, and I also included the one with the Make logo spin. Okay, so that was a... Uh, then I kistoscope that was basically uh, from the 1800s it was showing us uh, the type of technology they were using so uh, spinning it around um, and looking through the little slat it would make it uh, give you the illusion of movement and next up we are going to talk about the zoetrope there are all kinds of animation and one way of animating pictures is with the zoetrope and check it out here's one right here and it's got a little thing that makes it turn. And then there's a little, probably cardboard thing with little slots. And inside you can see there are pictures. And when we have it spin, you can see that the pictures are moving around. And it doesn't really look like much until you look through the little slots. And then now we've got a bunch of birds flying. And that's a zoetrope. So obviously, the zoetrope, zoetrope worked a lot better than the other unpronounceable one. Both of them boils down to having a series of 16 images. As long as you have those 16 images going by real fast, it creates the illusion. So what people did way back then was create just 16 images, each one slightly different. It is like a flip book. If you make a flip book, that's all that is. Making it go fast enough to give us the illusion of movement. Okay, so after scientists figured that out, 16 images in one second will trick us into, trick our eyes and brains into seeing movement. Second, they had to figure out how to put the images on a surface. They had to project it onto a surface. And that's where we had the magic lanterns. So remember the magic lanterns that we watched earlier? So that was just glass lantern slides that were painted with illustrations and then light shone on them. But, and so you would get a nice big image of whatever pretty um, painting was on this little thing. Uh, but unfortunately, those magic lanterns couldn't go as fast. You know, they, you could just one, right? And that was it. So they had to figure out how to make the images faster. Then someone said, okay, so the next step, now that we figured that out, we need to figure out how to use photography to make successive, successive meaning one after the other, successive pictures to project onto a clear surface. And we need to speed up the exposure time because at this point, you had to hold very, very still when your picture was being taken. That's why people didn't smile in those old pictures because you know, holding a smile for several minutes, I believe, would suck. All right? So then we had to think about exposure, the act. And what is exposure when we're talking about photography? The exposure means the act of presenting rays of light to a photosensitive surface. So the first, uh, we don't do that anymore though. We now have digital photography, which is completely different. But in the back in the day, the act of um, putting rays of light on a special type of surface so that you could transfer the image that 
was coming through the lens onto a different surface. The first photograph frame had an uh, exposure time of eight hours. So the very first one, you had to expose the surface to the light for eight hours. Can you imagine? I, I don't think we've got any pictures of people, so all stills, right? Um, and then the split second exposure became more feasible uh, in the late 1800s. That's where you got started getting the motion picture. Okay, the fourth precondition for motion pictures. Photographs need to be printed on a base flexible enough to pass through a camera rapidly. So in 1888, George Eastman devised a camera that made photographs on rolls of very thin paper, and that's where the company Kodak came from. Have you guys even heard of Kodak? I don't know. You might be too young. Anyway, uh, the next year he introduced a transparent roll of film, creating a breakthrough in the move towards cinema. Remember, motion picture. Fifth, we needed to find a suitable mechanism for cameras and projectors. So the camera, the film strip, had to stop briefly while light entered through the lens and exposed each frame. So a shutter had to cover the film as another frame moved into place. This all sounds very complicated and it was amazingly complicated. We don't really have stuff like that anymore. All right, and that's the end of day one. So if you look on Schoology, I should have on there something where you can type in a comment as your assignment. And that shows me that you were paying attention, okay? So everybody go ahead and do that, and I will catch you later.